According to the United States Environmental Protection Agency, wetlands are areas where water covers the soil or is present either at or near the surface of the soil all year or for varying periods of time during the year, including during the growing season. So there are two categories under which wetlands are classified, tidal and non-tidal. Tidal wetlands are those wetlands found along the coast and non-tidal wetlands are those found inland. For the purposes of my research, I'll be focusing solely on tidal wetlands, more specifically, salt marshes. Now, let's talk about the importance of wetlands. Wetlands are important because they affect many different aspects of society, including culture, the economy, and ecosystems. Unfortunately, wetlands are being lost at a rate of about 60,000 acres per year. And now we're going to talk about how that loss will affect each of these different aspects. According to NASA, CO2 levels are currently at 393 parts per million. That is way above the 350 part per million threshold that we should be at or below. This here, this graph starts at 2005 and it goes up to our current year. And as you can see, CO2 levels have increased dramatically. And these CO2 levels could be even higher if we didn't have the wetlands to hold in part of that CO2. So average global temperature has increased dramatically also over the past couple centuries, or decades rather. And the following images that you're gonna see come from NASA. The cooler colors represent colder temperatures, and the warmer colors, such as orange and reds, those represent the warmer temperatures. These, uh, these graphs that you're going to see, there are increments of 20 years, and so let's see what's been happening. 1920, that's 40, 60, 80, 2000, getting warmer, and 2010. So for comparative purposes, 1920 and 2010. And as a side note, it's not like this image was taken in the winter time and this one was in the summer. This is actually during the same time of year. So that's just immense. The next image that you see comes out of the Post and Courier from earlier this year. This is Spartina grass, but it's usually a lot greener and a lot more lively looking than this. This was taken at Wapu Creek in West Ashley, South Carolina. And the homeowner actually noticed that the Spartina grass wasn't growing, it's, it hasn't been growing back. It's been like this for much part of the year. And so another thing that I'll be doing is taking interviews, well, conducting interviews rather with homeowners and educators and researchers so I can see if they have noticed any visible differences in the wetlands that they currently interact with. I will also be growing Spartina grass and with this, I am gonna either grow it in a lab setting or, a na or its natural setting. And I'll be subjecting it to different changes in salinity because going back to the average temperature, average global temperature getting, getting hotter, if, if it gets hot enough and it's already been hot enough, a lot of the glaciers have already started to melt. And so that's gonna put an influx of fresh water into our salty seas. So I want to see how the Spartina grass would react to those different types of salinity changes. You open up a workbook to find a passage that reads something like, Because girls are usually more talkative, make more eye contact more often than men, and love to dress in eye-catching ways, they may appear to be coming on to a guy when in reality they're just being friendly. To the male, however, he perceives the girl wants him sexually. Asking herself what signal she is sending could save both sexes a lot of heartache. Now imagine the same workbook in a different class. You are reading a passage which states, Guys think so much more about sex because of the male hormone testosterone. What all of these passages have in common is that they utilize gender stereotypes to create a very specific message to students about male and female sexuality. Within the literature, scholars have noted that programs which utilize gender stereotypes also tend to contain the same themes and characteristics. 
For example, these programs often utilize themes of fear, contamination, and shame when teaching students about responsible sexual behaviors. Researchers also discuss the implications. Critics of, sexual, of sex education programs which use gender stereotypes often point to health, identity, and social consequences that may arise as a result of adhering to gender stereotypes. Social psychologists often cite how our attitudes can be predictive of behaviors, especially prejudiced attitudes when especially prejudiced attitudes when other social factors are kept at a minimum. In addition to this, researchers often cite how adolescence is strong is a time for strong identity development in adolescence. This is a time when adolescents are both forming their identity and using their experiences with peers as well as in the classroom to affirm their identities. I plan on doing two studies, one of which will be a content analysis of 10 sex education programs that are already used in the state of South Carolina, five of which will come from abstinence-only frameworks, while five will come from comprehensive frameworks. Within this content, content analysis, I plan to use myself as well as multiple researchers in coding the curricula of the sex education programs for the presence of gender stereotypes. I will do this by using the previous literature that has already identified the themes and stereotypes that tend to come up in the, re in the literature. Um, each researcher will independently read through the curricula, noting comments, quotes, and other materials which they found relevant in communicating gender stereotypes. After this is done, the researchers will once again meet to categorize these stereotypes as to what specific messages are being relayed. That such as victimization or objectification, which focuses namely on females, on body parts. Now in the second study, I plan to actually utilize my own sex education programs, which are designed based on the results of the first study. These programs will utilize both abstinence-only curricula and comprehensive curricula as a framework and will include a pre-assessment of students coming into the programs. This will be disguised in an after-school program given at a local high school where students will be given the option to sign up for an after-school after -school program focusing on sex education. Students who enroll in the program will be pre-assessed using a gender attitudes and beliefs inventory, also known as Gabby, that was created in 2001 with questions that are modified to pertain specifically to content that might come up in sex education programs, such as questions that focus on sexuality. From that, I will turn it into cDNA and run it through the PCR. The PCR just amplifies the DNA so that way we can see it when we get ready to do DNA sequencing and analysis. And so this comes into play when I mentioned earlier about the development of the zebrafish genome. And then in our lab, we did the genome-wide annotation of the immunoglobin right chain of God. So that's what that comes into play because we can use our reference and then also what we have found and compare the two. And then eventually I will compare the manipulated group and the control group to see what changes have occurred. And so for my expected results, I expect to see immunoglobin gene segment rearrangements more prevalent in the manipulated group than in the control group. The control group will probably have some mutations that will occur, probably just from the PBS that I injected within the fish. They have to find a way to adapt to this chemical that I place into their body. But for the manipulated group, their, more adapt their adaptation will occur and their mutations will occur for their survival. Now, not all the fish will survive. I don't expect all my fish to survive because it's almost like survival of the fittest. You just have to make sure that your body is fully equipped and under normal immune conditions in order for you to survive. So if something is wrong with a couple of fish, they probably will not survive. But for the ones that do survive, I'm looking for genetic diversity within their, within their genes, and then I'm looking for the rate of mutation. So how quickly did this occur? And essentially, we want to implement that so that way we can model it. So that's pretty much the big picture. What do they have that we're trying to model? Because the, what, the reason why they're different is because they have more chromosomes, meaning they have more genes that cope for different things. We don't have that, but if we can find a way to model it, then we can eventually use that to create more vaccines, more antibodies, and just different things to help 
fight off this bacteria and that way our body can fight it off instead of us contracting the disease and then fighting it off. So that's essentially my whole proposal and my project. I will be implementing this within the fall semester, so you guys will be seeing me going back and forth out to grad school lab. And so I just want to thank you all for your support. And at this time, I will take any questions, comments, or questions.